Good afternoon, Dr. Forbes. How are you? Ravi here. Good afternoon, Ravi. How are you? Huh? Good, sir. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this afternoon. It's indeed a great privilege for us to have you on this. My very much, my very much, my pleasure, Giri. Giri, thank you for the thank you for the prompt. I was quite happily relaxing over here this morning. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you, Ravi. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. So, Mr. Kiran, let us know when we are ready to go live. We will start. Uh, sure, sir. Just one minute to go. Yeah. Now, some way in which I can um, go to. No, I can, I can never remember all the different platforms. Now, WebEx doesn't have a. No, it does have. It does have a grid view. It does. Good. Got it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Sarvi, we can start now. We are live. Yeah. Thank you, Kiran. So, good evening, uh, everybody. And uh, firstly, welcome uh, to this uh, CII uh, Energy Efficiency Leadership Series. Um, as many of you may be aware, uh, this is the eighth edition of uh, the thought leadership uh, program that we have launched and it's indeed uh, a proud privilege and honor for me to welcome and um, have today one of our tallest leaders uh, in the indian industry and also one of uh, you know the the leaders in the in the area of energy efficiency we have with us uh, dr naushad forbes um i think not you know we, he probably doesn't need an introduction but i think uh, you know we just need to um, you know give give uh, uh, for those uh, people who are on the cii hype platform uh, i will try and give a quick short introduction to dr forbes um i think dr forbes is the uh, co-chairman of uh, forbes marshall and also past president uh, confederation of indian industry under his leadership, Forbes Marshall, Forbes Marshall has transformed into a leading uh, steam engineering and control instrumentation firm. Um, he's also, you know, brought in a lot of new initiatives, uh, encompassing energy efficiency, capacity building, uh, training and skilling, and also the industry academia relationship, which of course is extremely important in the context of science and technology area. Um, and of course, uh, you know, he's one who has been advocating uh, innovation as a key pillar for the Indian industry as well. Uh, Dr. Forbes also leads and as a chairman for the uh, Ananta Aspen Center, uh, the Bharatiya Yuva Shakti Trust, and the Center for Technology, Innovation, and uh, Economic Research. Uh, Dr. Forbes, uh, you know, he has completed his bachelor's, master's, PhD from Stanford University and was also a consulting professor at Stanford during the period 1987 to 2004. Uh, Dr. Forbes' uh, leadership contribution is uh, is quite, uh, you know, very intense and, uh, you know, I, it take a long time for me to go through, but on a very high level, I think he's been leading and mentoring us at CII. Um, as a past president of CII, uh, co-chairman of the Economic Affairs Council, and uh, chairman uh, for India at 75 Foundation. Uh, Dr. Forbes also has uh, been instrumental uh, in developing many educational and capacity development programs uh, on technology. Uh, he's also a board member of several educational institutions and public companies. Um, Chairperson, National Committee for Higher Education, Innovation, Technology, and International Business, and a strong advocate on the importance of energy efficiency for achieving competitiveness in the Indian industry. I think there's no better person um, to talk about energy efficiency, and we are extremely honored to have you, Dr. Forbes, uh, this uh, afternoon, and we really look forward to hearing from you. Um, with that brief introduction, I would hand it back to you, Dr. Forbes. Thank you very much, Ravi. Thank you for your very warm and kind introduction. And, uh, um, you know, it, it truly wasn't necessary for 
uh, for a couple of reasons. First, this is a CI audience. Second, this is a uh, this is a CI GBC audience, and it's always a great pleasure to participate in any function of uh, the Green Business Center. Uh, as I think many of you would know, uh, the Godred GBC is uh, one of our most, in fact, not one of our most, it is our most successful center of excellence uh, within uh, CI. Uh, it provides a range of services that are hugely appreciated by industry. Um, and I think many of the programs that we run from GBC are really landmark programs that have pioneered and initiated a whole series of things for Indian industry and for India in general. Uh, the Green Building Program is our flagship program. Uh, and I think India today, Giri, am I right in saying that it has, today we have the second largest number of uh, platinum rated buildings in the world. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that out of all the Green Building Code rated buildings in the country, uh, GBC, Godred GBC, has actually assessed about 80% of them. Would that be right? Yeah, I think those are those are the, the numbers I hear from time to time. So it's we've truly, we've truly, I think, pioneered uh, the entire field for the country. And it's a it's a it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful contribution. Uh, so I want to thank you both, uh, Ravi and Gary, for the opportunity to think about energy conservation and to think about energy scenarios. Uh, at present, uh, you know, over this, this, this is sort of our business as a company. Uh, it's been a long-standing passion for me, uh, but in recent years, I've kind of gone off into too many directions and too many general things. Uh, so this was a nice opportunity to revisit uh, the entire energy field uh, to catch up with what's been happening because you know, I've been reading the papers and reading. Um, articles here and there, um, but uh, I've not thought about this systematically in some time. Um, and what I did was to, uh, as a part of preparing for today, uh, I looked at two books uh, and I wanted to mention them and recommend them. Um, one is by uh, a Nobel Prize winning physicist named Burton Richter. Uh, who wrote a book a few years ago called Beyond Smoke and Mirrors, which is uh, a book about, uh, it's a book about uh, climate change and energy. Uh, in fact, the subheading is climate change and energy in the 21st century. The second is uh, a book called Fossil Free, which came out just a few weeks ago by uh, Sumanth Sinha. Sumanth is uh, one of our um, leading CI members. Uh, he's a past uh, chair of the Northern Region. And uh, um, again, uh, a very, both are excellent books, I think, in terms of providing background in the, in the broader space of energy, climate change, and a certain amount on energy efficiency. So what I'm going to try and do is to talk about three different topics. And I'm going to talk about these topics as a base for us having a good discussion and good Q&A session uh, afterwards. And I'll try and be, uh, I'll try, try to be as brief as I can so that we have more time for Q&A. Um, and the three topics that I'll briefly cover are to give you some background on the energy, energy scenario in the world today and in India today. Um, and my purpose is not to be comprehensive, is just to provide you with enough background so that we're all starting from the same point. It's not, I think, I think for this audience, it won't really be uh, adding a lot of knowledge, but uh, I think it's important for us all to be at a certain, a certain common platform. Second, uh, I'll talk particularly about the potential for energy conservation. Uh, within our energy scenarios, within the future that we are trying to build for ourselves uh, in a more energy efficient and climate friendly world. And then third, uh, I'd like to spend time talking about the economics of energy conservation and climate change, because um, it seems to me that uh, 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 I'm going to make the case anyway, that unless we address the economics, um, we keep uh, we keep sort of going two steps forward, one step back uh, in our 
in our efforts to improve our energy future. So let me start um, with some background on the energy scenario in the world and in the country today. Uh, and this is just, let me start by reminding you that uh, uh, we are currently, as a world, going through a great energy transition. And the world has been through two energy transitions in the past. Uh, the first uh, was a few years ago. The first was uh, uh, started in the late 18th century uh, with uh, the move from uh, human power, animal power, uh, and wood as uh, sources of energy and as motive forces. Um, and it was a move to the use of coal and the steam engine uh, as a way of powering um, what we wanted to achieve as humans. So that really powered steam, the steam engine and coal powered the industrial revolution. And it set in place uh, the 200 years of economic growth that we've seen uh, over these last two and a half centuries. The second energy transition, as you all know, was the transition to oil, uh, which started in the late 19th century, but really picked up speed post 1950. And probably its leading feature has been the transport revolution that the availability of a cheap, um, highly energy compact fuel um, provided. Uh, it, uh, you know, it's powered uh, air travel, uh, road travel, shipping. Uh, you know, the cost of shipping today, um, if you look at the cost of shipping today, the cost of shipping today, I believe the number is, is 2%. Uh, of what it was uh, 150 years ago. And that, uh, that kind of dramatic change that's taken place um, is thanks to the, the second energy transition, and it's thanks to that kind of dramatic change in the cost of uh, moving goods around um, that we have the world that is as integrated as it is today. And now we're in the middle of uh, the third transition. Uh, with renewables joining the mix and with renewables growing hugely in their share of new energy capacity being put in place um, in the world. So if you look at where the world is now, um, the rough numbers at present uh, for the world uh, says that the world relies today roughly 27% on coal, um, about 23% on natural gas, around a third, 33% on oil, uh, around 4% on nuclear, and renewables are around 11%. Yeah? And if you add the numbers up, that says that the world today um, is reliant on fossil fuels for 85%, roughly, of its total primary energy needs. If you look at the use of where energy is used. Around a third of total energy is used worldwide in industry. Around 27% is used in transport, 29% in buildings for heating and cooling, and around 11% the balance is for everything else. So if you look at India and the Indian scenario relative to the world, you'll see that coal plays a much bigger part in our totally primary energy uh, sources. Uh, coal is uh, over 50% of India's total energy uh, sources. If you, if you take formal, I should say formal energy sources, I'm not counting um, energy sources that come from animal waste, uh, which is still a significant share of our total primary energy demand in the country, but it's actually something we need to move away from. Um, natural gas is very small in India, uh, growing but very small. Uh, oil um, is significant. Uh, it's also around a third uh, uh, as it is worldwide uh, of our primary energy sources. Nuclear, a little smaller than worldwide, so instead of 4%, I think we're at around 2-3%. And renewables, 
uh, against the world's 11 percent, uh, we're at around 9 percent uh, in terms of total uh, energy, primary energy sources. But if you look at renewables in our own country today, uh, renewables are growing massively. Uh, recent bids uh, for solar power, utility-based solar power, um, have come in at the lowest rates in the world, um, at uh, roughly two rupees uh, 35 paisa uh, a unit. Um, that compares with, uh, if you look at the numbers, that compares with a cost of three rupees and 20 paisa per unit that NTPC charges um, for its own power when it supplies it uh, into, into the grid. So uh, new solar power is today significantly cheaper than uh, existing, than existing, let alone new, than existing um, thermal power based on coal. And as a result, in 2019, last year, we added totally as a country around 20 gigawatts of electric generating capacity. Uh, and 60% of that 20 gigawatts came from renewables, roughly 9 gigawatts from solar and 3 gigawatts from wind. So we've seen this huge shift. Uh, that's taking place in a very short period of time, in basically the last five or six years, from being almost entirely reliant on coal-based electric power to being much more now investing in renewables. And this is where living this third great energy transition in our country as we speak. Our goal as a country, as you know, um, is to raise the current percentage of renewables in our energy mix from 9% to 25% by 2030. That's what we've committed. And it's a very challenging goal, but a goal that is actually achievable on the basis of the current generating capacity and tenders and so on that are being issued. We've also made a commitment uh, as part of the Paris Accord that by 2030, we will reduce our energy intensity per unit of GDP by around 35%. Um, that's from 2005 to 2030. And that 35% reduction is actually not difficult to do. We're actually, as of now, as of 2020, we're actually ahead uh, of where we've committed to be if you draw a straight line between where we were and where we have targeted being by 2030. And we can aim to do better. Um, and all of this says that, you know, for many, many years, for, for, for decades, I mean, when I was, when I was uh, in college um, in, the, in the late 70s and early 80s, um, you know, solar energy was always spoken about um, as uh, as off the future, you know, solar energy is coming. It's going to be off the future, and I started getting worried that at some point in time, you know, solar energy always seemed to be in the future. It was like Brazil. It was uh, uh, it was the it was off the future, and it always would be off the future. Um, but in the last uh, in the last five years, uh, it's become very much a reality. It's become uh, something that is very much uh, uh, a source, an energy source that's available to us um, here and now, and that's that's taking an increasing share uh, in our total current energy scenario. Let me move to the next topic, which is energy conservation. In all of our talk about this energy transition and new energy scenarios, um, you know, I feel that energy conservation doesn't get as much attention and as much focus as it could very usefully get. Um, and let me give you a few numbers uh, to help make that case. Um, a recent article in the Financial Times um, about, a, about a month ago, I think, uh, reported a study that was done in the US recently. And it made 
the comment. It's quite an astounding comment. It said that 67% of primary energy in the US is wasted, right? And that just 33%, one third of all primary energy in the US does useful work. And that's a fairly dramatic statistic, if you think of it, that two thirds is wasted, one third does useful work. Yeah? So that's the potential. Uh, it's not that the technology exists here and now for us to be able to achieve that, but in terms of long run development, that's the potential. Right? Where does this 33% useful work come from? Well, the average thermal efficiency of a coal-fired power plant in the US is currently 32%. It's not very different in our own country. It's also, I think, around that same figure. Giri probably can give us a more uh, accurate, accurate number. I think it's around 30% um, in, in India now. If you take the average efficiency in transport, uh, the average efficiency in transport in the US is 21%. If you take average car efficiency, um, which is about two thirds of all the consumption in the US, it's much less in India, by the way. If you take average car efficiency, around the car efficiency, actual car efficiency is typically around 12%, right? What happens to the remaining uh, 88%? Well, 60% is lost to heat, right? Nothing else, just to heat. 17% um, is lost in idling, meaning the car's not moving at all. Um, and then you only have around 18% for the energy that actually starts to go to the drivetrain. And by the time it actually reaches the wheels and pushes the car forward, um, you end up with only 12%. So you've got these huge opportunities for energy saving um, that happens right across the chain. If you compare an electric car, an electric car converts around 90% uh, of the energy that's stored in the car um, into useful energy that moves the wheels because of direct drives, you don't have a transmission, you don't have all of these various um, mechanisms that um, are inefficient in transmitting energy from one, from one source to the other. And as long as that electricity, as long as that's a big if, as long as that electricity doesn't come from coal-fired power plants, you're okay. But if the energy comes from coal-fired power plants, then you're starting off with 32% average efficiency and then going from 32% down by another 10%. So you end up with a lower efficiency, but still a lot better um, than in a regular internal combustion engine, petrol-driven car. A second study, uh, again reported in the Financial Times recently, uh, was from Cambridge University in the UK. And it made the comment on energy efficiency that using only existing technology, yep, so this is their qualification, using only existing technology, consumption could be reduced, energy consumption could be reduced by over 20% without difficulty. Yeah. And that means that if you take, say, 80% of our energy needs being met by fossil fuels in the world today, right, a 20% decrease means that we can see a 16% fall in greenhouse gas emissions or in carbon emissions simply by energy efficiency using current existing technology. Right? And a 16% fall in total emissions from the current base um, is a very substantial number. It creates a lot of space uh, for us to meet the world's and India's uh, long-term greenhouse gas emission targets, um, global warming targets, and so on. How does this, so what, what, are the, what, are the, what are the things that we need to do? Well, let me give you a couple more numbers in terms of the potential for energy conservation. Um, one more number from Burton Richter writing about the US. He points out that um, after the oil shock of 1973, when the price of oil multiplied overnight almost, 
uh, the U.S. put in place um, compulsory fuel efficiency standards for automobiles. Um, these standards came into effect from 1975. And it shows that in 10 years, from 1975 to 1985, the average fuel efficiency in the U.S. rose from 14 miles per gallon to 28 miles per gallon. In other words, average fuel efficiency doubled in a 10-year period. That's quite, if you think of it, that's quite a dramatic improvement that, was, that took place in a pretty short period of time. Right? If you look at the energy intensity to GDP um, metrics for the world, um, energy intensity to GDP has been improving. If you go back a long time, if you go back to 1900, from essentially 1900 to 1970, energy intensity to GDP improved by around 1% a year, right? So the world was getting roughly 1% more efficient each year than it was the previous year. Between 1970 and 1990, energy efficiency improved by 2.7% each year. Since 1990, it's gone back to about a 1% improvement rate uh, year on year. Now I'll come back to why we saw this dramatic improvement from 1970, and then we've seen it level off after that. Let me give you an example uh, from our own company. Um, you know, we work in thermal energy conservation in industry. And in 2003, we did a study together with CI to estimate the difference between the average efficiency of a plant in its use of steam energy and the best in that industry. And we found that the gap between the average plant and the best plant across, if I remember correctly, six industry sectors was 21%. We then did another round of the study in 2009. And in that six year period, uh, there was an improvement of around 20% uh, in the efficiency with which energy was consumed. Uh, in industry. And we found in 2009 that there was still 21% potential uh, and gap between the average plant and the best plant. So the average had improved by 20%, but the potential was still another 20%. Um, and we're now in the process of doing a third round of that study. Um, and uh, again, uh, we would expect to find that average efficiency has improved by a further 20-30%, but we would guess that the potential, uh, if we go by the energy audits that we do typically and so on, we would guess that the typical potential for energy efficiency and energy improvement actually is between 18 to 20% even now. So there's still this continuous ongoing opportunity that exists for energy conservation across industry. Yeah. And in India, you know, industry consumes around half of all the primary energy in the country. So if we can improve energy efficiency in industry, we're really going to dramatically improve uh, the energy outlook for us as a country. Let me give you another example from our own, from our own industry and our own field. One of the things that we've been focusing on of late is something very simple. It's called condensate recovery. Let me, I'll explain it in a sentence. You know, when steam is used as a source of process heat in industry, uh, the steam condenses. Uh, you use the latent heat and the steam to heat your process, and then you're left with condensate. Now, this condensate is valuable. It contains heat. It's typically at 100 degrees or so uh, Celsius, and it's very pure water. Now, you would think that it's fairly obvious that this valuable condensate should be returned back to the boiler so that you uh, capture the heat that's in the condensate and you use the clean, pure water that condensate is. We've done a mapping exercise um, for industry just these last two months or so, and we find that there is roughly potential to improve condensate recovery by around 30%. What does that mean? 
it means of saving in fuel cost, so fuel reduction, reduction in actual fuel consumption of around 7%. And that adds up to about 1,000 crores a year for the plants that we currently map this for. And the water saving that we're talking about comes to around 3,500 tons of water per hour, right? So a very significant number again. You know, if you want to, if you want to convert 3,500 tons of water um, into something that we can relate to, 3,500 tons of water is about 300 tankers. So it's about 300 tankers of water saving per hour. Right? Now, as you all know, as a country, uh, a water scarce country, and uh, here we have a ready, easy potential, attractive payback opportunity to save 300 tankers worth of water an hour. So that's the potential that exists in energy conservation. I mean, this is one specific example. I gave you the US numbers for cars and so on. Um, but if you look in almost any area, you will find similar potential savings. Um, you know, any of you uh, who, uh, you know, in the, last, in the last eight months, we've um, got used to not being in hotel rooms um, for conferences like this one. But typically, if we were in a hotel room, we would be fiddling with the thermostat because it's generally either too cold or too hot. Um, and uh, for some reason, you know, and uh, this is an opportunity for, for, for Ravi, for your, for your business, you know, <laughs> the, the, you know, generally, I mean, I can never understand why um, our hotel industry cannot get the temperature in public space broadly right. It's literally either the air conditioning either seems to be off or it seems to be on absolutely full blast so that everyone freezes. So lots of opportunities to potentially save substantially in our energy consumption. Let me come to the last topic, um, and then I'll stop, um, which is the economics of energy conservation and climate change. Because I think that unless we address the, the basic economics of energy conservation and climate change, we're missing a, a, a huge opportunity. You know, I, I started talking about um, us being in third great energy transition to renewables in place of fossil fuels. If you look at the US, the US used to be like India, around 50% of its uh, total primary energy came from coal. Uh, this was not that long ago, this was 20 years ago. And then thanks to shale oil and gas, um, coal dropped to around 20% this year in terms of its total primary energy usage, um, energy sources. But next year, coal is projected to rise, coal use in the US is projected to rise by 23%, uh, replacing that extra, that extra increase in the total share coming from coal is going to again take the place of gas. Why? Because this year, as a result of COVID, energy prices fell. Because energy prices fell, drilling was cut back in the US. Because drilling was cut back in the US, um, gas prices, gas availability dropped. Because gas availability dropped, gas prices went up. And now coal prices are lower than gas prices. So next year, coal is going to show its first substantial growth in consumption in the US. Uh, in 20 years. Yeah? Now, renewables will still grow a little bit, um, but emissions in the US are going to rise next year uh, because of this switch from gas to coal. Now, as a company, let me give you another example. As a company, we're, we're now quite active in different parts of the world. And as we've gone around and tried to promote energy conservation in different parts of the world, there is some place, you know, in, in India, we get a very, a very warm reception when you go and talk to any country. Um, you go to Indonesia, you get a warm reception. You go to most countries, you get a warm reception, but there are some exceptions, right? In Bangladesh, for example, um, 
Bangladesh has long had highly subsidized fuel. Uh, they have a lot of gas. Um, gas is provided to industry at a subsidized rate. And until recently, it was provided in a very strange way, which is that they had meters, gas meters, uh, on the boilers that were operating, but um, they didn't trust the meters. So because they didn't trust the meters, uh, they said, okay, you've got a five ton per hour boiler. So this is your monthly charge. So it was on based on the boiler capacity, not based on how much gas you consume. Now, if you operate on that basis, you remove any incentive um, to actually save energy, because why should you? Yeah? Um, that started to change now in the last two or three years. Uh, and there's a real push now in Bangladesh with a lot of opposition, by the way, from industry um, to meter gas and to charge for what is actually consumed, which is the base, the base of energy conservation efforts. In Egypt, um, gas and oil was heavily subsidized. And over the last two years, again, there's been a move to remove those subsidies. And as you remove those subsidies, again, the interest in energy conservation um, is growing. I think in, in India, uh, we have long had much better economics. Um, you know, fuel costs have been relatively high. We've tended not to subsidize, especially not subsidize industry in terms of its energy. So we have better practices that have been in place for a fair amount of time. But even in industry, in these last, uh, in this last eight, nine months, as, as oil prices have fallen, um, what have we seen? We've seen that a previous shift that was taking place to biomass as a fuel source um, for generating processed steam um, has slowed down. And people are going back to using their old oil-fired boilers. I'm sure that will correct itself. But a lot of this is short run on the basis of actual fuel costs. So what should we do? And this is what I'd like to end with. And I'd like to end with a, a proposal. And this is a proposal that, uh, uh, that Giri has, I think, heard before. Um, so I'm going to make the proposal that high energy prices are good energy prices. Um, because high energy prices force conservation, force a reduction in emissions, uh, and force one to do all those right things that will push the world in the right direction. And not only are high energy prices good, but an energy price shock is even better because an energy price shock really captures everyone's attention. Remember that bit from uh, the world's 1% reduction from 19, 1900 to 1970, and then jumping to 2.7% over the next 16, 17 years until oil prices fell again, <laughs> right? So an energy price shock is even better. So here's my proposal. So my proposal is that we should tax ourselves at a rate of 100% um, for all our energy spending. So whatever we pay for petrol or diesel for our cars, electricity at our homes, or fuel oil or coal or biomass in our plants, right? whatever we pay, we should write the same check to our own account. right? I'm not suggesting that we be generous and pay the tax to the government. Um, I'm suggesting that we just take whatever we're spending and put the same amount again into our own account and then use that money for anything that we wish to invest in anything that we wish we can use it use it for a company party if you want use it for anything that you wish use some of it hopefully for energy conversion matters energy saving matters pollution control matters i hope we will use it for that but it becomes then a resource that's available but the key thing is the high energy cost because if we have a really high energy cost, and if our energy costs double from next month, right? So do it from the 1st of January. If our energy costs double from the 1st of January, 
the shock that we would receive would focus our minds and our attention on all those different things that will then drive a really good energy saving program and a climate change program. Yeah? Let me stop there. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, uh, that brilliant, uh, uh, brilliant lecture. Uh, delegates, my request to all of you to kindly uh, send in your questions through, through the chat box. We will uh, communicate the questions to Dr. Forbes. We have already received uh, quite a few, sir. Uh, I'll present them uh, one by one to you uh, for your uh, for your uh, opinion. Uh, the first first question you spoke about energy transitions. A few of them have asked, "What do you think is going to be the next energy transition? Is it a fossil fuel, fossil free energy, or automation, or transportation?" You are muted, sir. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I said the, the energy transition that people are talking about now, that we're in now as a third great energy transition, is a transition from fossil fuels to renewables. Now, what do we include in renewables? We certainly include solar, wind. Some people include hydro and should. Um, so we include a set of things in renewables, um, uh, geothermal, um, and or people very often also in, include biomass. Right? And let me give you um, good biomass example, bad biomass example. Good biomass example is what we do in our country. Right? Um, you have energy waste, uh, you know, waste from agric various agricultural products, uh, which is converted into biomass. And we use that as an alternative to biofuel, uh, to, uh, uh, to fossil fuels. Let me give you an example of bad biomass. Bad biomass. Um, last year, I went to a, I went to a distillery in Scotland, and at this distillery in Scotland, we went and visited the boiler, because it was supplied by uh, one, uh, our joint venture partners actually. And when we went and visited the boiler, so I asked them. I said, "Where do you get your?" biomass from because they were getting these really nice clean biomass pellets um and he said oh we get our biomass pellets from canada and i kept thinking you know that this makes no sense um so you know you harvest a forest in canada you turn it into biomass pellets you ship it across the ocean in a ship that runs on oil um and then this is somehow clean um i have a problem with that yeah, so it seems to me, you know, that this is a this is subsidies that uh, take one in a very strange direction, um, uh, and I think we should make sure that whatever we do is aligned with actually reducing uh, fossil fuel consumption, um, looking at the whole supply chain. Thank you, sir. The next question is on uh, energy efficiency. A uh, lot of them have said that we have done well in energy efficiency in India. Many sectors in India are leading the world in terms of energy efficiency. Western world has not done well, particularly Europe and US, he says. Uh, how can we make them do better, number one? Number two, how can India lead the world uh, in terms of energy efficiency? So, you know, so it's not true that the Western world has not done well. It, you know, the Western world is not one case. Um, if you look at the, the, the approach of the US and the approach of uh, Europe have been quite different. Um, second, within Europe, different countries have very different patterns. Um, and within the US, different states have approached things very differently. So the fuel efficiency standard that I talked about for the US was actually a California standard uh, that was first put through in the 60s in California, so very early on. And then it was adopted nationally after 1973 um, and adopted nationally and then became a national fuel efficiency standard. Um, and California has typically been um, at the forefront of, uh, uh, of uh, climate change mitigation um, and moves, um, and moves to, to reduce emissions. Um, unfortunately, 
climate change, like everything in the U.S. these days, is a very politicized subject. Um, it shouldn't be, but it is. Um, and it's, uh, you know, that's why uh, uh, the, the current uh, uh, 45th president pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Accord um, and why the 46th president, the president has said that his first act as president will be to put the U.S. back into the Paris Accord. So it's very politicized. But um, I think we'll see progress in the next four years that we haven't in the last four. Um, if you look at Europe, uh, you know, you have, let's say, a country like Norway, which now uh, has announced that by 2030, it expects, I think it's by 2030, it expects that all new cars sold in Norway will be electric vehicles, um, which is a very dramatic shift from where it is now. And it already has the highest percentage of electric vehicle sales uh, of any country uh, in the world. Um, if you look at uh, what we're seeing now, different countries have announced um, that they will, you know, emissions have peaked in many countries now, the US, uh, in um, most of Europe, um, and many have announced that they will be, uh, have net zero carbon emissions um, by a certain day. So the US is now, the US and Japan um, have both recently announced that they will be uh, net carbon neutral uh, by 2050. Um, China's announced, China's the largest polluter in the world, um, has announced that it will be net carbon neutral by 2060. We have to see them get there, but that's what they've announced. Um, and most European countries are going to reach carbon neutrality much before 2050, um, you know, some by 2030 and earlier. So uh, I think, you know, you, you, see, you see the West actually going ahead with many of these areas. And, um, um, you know, if you look, at, you look at Germany's policies on solar power, I always worried about them because I always thought, you know, they seem to be... Uh, uh, you know, Germany is not the country that I, when I when I think of Germany, I don't. The first thing I don't think of is sun. Um, but uh, they had this extremely ambitious solar power program, which has really had a dramatic effect in terms of renewables as a share of total energy generated in the country. Um, very far along in its uh, in its energy uh, conservation and climate change efforts. So I think. Uh, we, there's lots to learn from the West, lots to learn from the experience of different European countries, um, and lots to learn from some states, <laughs> not the country as a whole, maybe, but some states in the US. Thank you, sir. The next set of questions is around finance. Uh, many of them say you said about technology being available. Uh, uh, he says uh, he has been trying to implement a project for the last four years, but every time the project is getting stalled because of finance. What is it uh, uh, that you would like to uh, advise him on? So it depends on, you know, it depends on the project and what the payback is. I'll give you, so, so I think it is an issue and it isn't an issue. It is an issue for all the longer term payback projects. So if you take solar power, for example, financing is essential um, because solar power can actually, is what's made solar power viable is actually access to efficient mechanisms for financing and efficient ways in which financing can be combined with the technology uh, to provide this alternative fuel. Um, and if you have paybacks of five years and up, only with really good efficient financing mechanisms, do you see those kinds of projects moving ahead. If you have paybacks of you know, for many of the energy conservation examples I was talking about earlier, they have paybacks of a year, maximum two years. If you have a payback of a year and two years, you know, financing is, it's not irrelevant, but it's almost irrelevant. Um, because, uh, you know, why wouldn't you go ahead and do it somehow um, in the short run, uh, given that it tends to be many small things that do not necessarily involve huge investments. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
two questions on uh, uh, what do you think would uh, happen to the trajectory of uh, energy efficiency investments and activities one with renewable energy becoming 2 rupees 30 paisa per unit will it make the company spend more on putting up renewables rather than working on energy efficiency second will covid affect the the strategies of the companies in terms of uh, their energy efficiency initiatives uh, sorry what was the second one with regard to covid <clears throat> Will will COVID uh, affect the trajectory for energy conservation in industries from a priority or so, strategy point of view? So, so you know, on the on the first on the first point, um, I'm not sure it's necessarily that the low cost of um, uh, of renewable energy will affect energy efficiency by industry. I think it's more um, that it's easier to do something big than to do many small things. And you see, energy efficiency requires doing many, many small, low investment things. Um, you know, setting up a power plant is one big thing. Um, so I, uh, I worry about that more than anything else. You know, that, um, you know, you know, setting up a, making a large investment receives a lot of management attention to receive a boardroom presentation and all of that. Um, Energy efficiency involves a hundred small things that you have to do that at much lower investment will add up to a greater benefit. Um, but those hundred small things need adequate attention across the organization. And it's much more of a management issue than if you ask me a technical issue or even a financial issue. Um, on the COVID question, uh, I worry about COVID in terms of its impact on energy prices. As long as energy prices sustain and energy prices rise, I don't think COVID will have an impact on energy conservation. Um, if COVID leads to a fall in consumption and then a fall in prices that sustains, um, then that more than anything else is damaging energy conservation efforts. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, it's from an engineer who is involved in uh, energy efficiency. There are about 400 uh, uh, young people, particularly energy auditors, energy efficiency engineers who are listening to this uh, conversation, sir. He says, innovation, a lot of things are happening in IT and other uh, related areas. Not much in hardcore energy efficiency. For example, boiler is operating the same as it was about 30 years back. What do you think should be done to promote innovation uh, in these areas? I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, it's one of those, if you look at how, how do fields like boilers, I mean, you know, boilers, the basic construct of a boiler hasn't changed in, when did we go from two pass to three pass boilers? Oh, I don't know, 40 years back. Um, and that was probably the last significant move forward. Okay, we've since seen, you know, better, better burners, better combustion technologies, better fluid dynamic modeling so that you can improve uh, air to fuel mixing and so on. Um, I, think, I think it's time for another rethink yeah, of uh, some of the fundamentals of how we, how we actually run boilers, uh, how efficiently we can make them. Um, you know, can we shrink the total size down by uh, running boilers on oxygen? as opposed to uh, uh, air, um, you know, are there opportunities to uh, greatly improve and enhance efficiency uh, through different kinds of materials of chimneys such that one can have flue gas emissions that are at much lower temperatures and so on. You know, how do we, how do we move in the direction of the theoretical efficiency of a boiler? Uh, you know, why, why is it that at present we're stuck at this 80, 82, 85% uh, range that uh, we should be able to get beyond. So I, I, I agree, I think it's a good question. And I think it's the kind of question that, you know, there should be challenges to industry and to manufacturers of boilers like us in terms of saying, well, um, show that you can make a boiler that operates consistently and on, on an ongoing basis at 92%, at 95%. Um, and, Never mind if it's not financially viable and maybe it's too expensive for people to invest in initially. But show that it's 
technically possible. And then once it's technically possible, now let's make it financially viable. Yeah. Um, because you, that's how you start. You start by making one, and then maybe when you make 20, you start making it much more, uh, much more feasible from a practical angle. Thank you, sir. We have some more questions. Probably we are running out of time. Uh, as I said, there are about 400 engineers, uh, young people particularly, who are involved in energy and energy efficiency who are listening to you. What would be your piece of advice to them, uh, Dr. Forbes? So, you know, first of all, you're in a great field, right? Because you're in a field where um, the potential is so huge. Uh, you know, the, the, the number I gave you for the US, the number is not, we don't have a number like that for India, but it's not going to be a different number, right? Um, so if actual energy efficiency in a grand sense is one third, right? Um, that you know that only one third of actual energy is converted into useful work. Um, that says you're in the field that should be concerned with that two thirds, right? And how does that two thirds shrink, right? And what can we do? It's the kind of thing that we have to implement and do, plant by plant, initiative by initiative, um, across the board, and see how over time, you know, by things that you all do on a monthly basis, how can we bring about that improvement in energy efficiency that we need? Let me, let me suggest a good target for us. Um, you know, our goal as a country is to grow our total manufacturing output um, by around 10% a year over the next decade at least. Um, and that's the best we've achieved in the 2000s, um, about 10% a year for a extended period of about eight, nine years. And if we're going to grow our total manufacturing output by 10% a year, um, what is that going to do to our energy consumption in industry? Because typical energy consumption in industry as a percentage of output has been improving by about two and a half percent year on year on year in the country over these last 30 years. Now, if we're going to grow output by 10%, that says we will grow our energy consumption also by around seven and a half percent. Can we, is there a way in which we can save so much in terms of our energy consumption that we don't grow output at all? That our total energy consumed stays where it is now while our output of industry grows by 10% year on year. Um, it's not easy, it's very challenging. But the first year or two, the first two years are easy. Um, because the opportunities are there right now. So let's achieve the first two years. And then in the course of the first two years, the suggestion I would make to you is that you will yourselves find additional potential. Because as you do particular things in industry, you will find more things that can be done. And those more things can again start turning into, uh, into new proposals and new opportunities that will exist in our, in our firms. But I think our goal should be that, that how do we grow our output 10% year on year for 10 years and keep our total, our total energy consumption the same. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very ambitious target you have given. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we are almost running out of time. May I now request uh, uh, Mr. Ravi to take over and present the concluding remarks, please. Mr. Ravi. Ravi? I think we may have a connection. Ah, it's a... Yeah, yeah, I, I, yes, I thank, you. Really thank you. Thank you. You are muted again, sir. Uh, Ravi, you are muted again. Ravi? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, fine, sir. Thank you. Sorry, I had some problems. Uh, I'm, I'm getting used to WebEx, you know, so. <laughs> 
Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Forbes. That was uh, very inspirational, very insightful, and uh, you know, beautifully uh, presented. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work to do for us uh, in the space of energy efficiency. And uh, and as you rightly said, I mean, it's a great opportunity, given the fact that India's one trillion dollar manufacturing GDP. So I, I think uh, there's never be there's never been a better moment to really focus on energy efficiency. Uh, when it comes to uh, you know india at this point in time so thanks for that and i'll move on to the last part of the uh, the the session um, basically i just wanted to share with you all that this kind of today what you have set here is kind of a curtain raiser for a week long energy conservation event that we are launching uh, enercon 2020 and uh, move on to the next slide uh, we have put together a program where we have about 30 plus uh, thought leaders uh, speaking on different teams and different platforms over the next uh, four or five days. Um, and this is an afternoon session. We have six uh, day virtual session and we expect about 1000 plus participants on the Hive uh, platform as well. Uh, next, please. And uh, we've also taken this opportunity to, uh, you know, recognize and, uh, uh, you know, award uh, two categories uh, for a poster competition on energy efficiency. Uh, the two categories are one for the companies and the other one was for the individuals and companies. And each of these categories have five uh, uh, winners. And when I say five winners, it's not uh, somebody is one or two. Everybody is one in that category. Um, the jury, I think we had an eminent uh, panel uh, led by uh, Mr. K. N. Rao, former director and uh, of ACC. Uh, but I think for, for a different approach we have taken here this time is that we had five young emerging leaders in energy efficiency who won the award recently in the Energy Efficiency Summit. And these four young leaders were the initial first screening jury. And then they finally sat down together with Mr. K. N. Rao and chose these five winners. And let me quickly move on to announce the winners uh, in the best practices in energy efficiency. The winner is Malabar Regional Cooperative Milk Producers Union from Kolikode. And that's really an exciting thing to you know, get some entry from Kolikode. Uh, Jindal Steel Orissa is a second uh, uh, winner. Uh, News Tamil Nadu Newsprints and Papers is the third winner. Next, please. Adaman Fabrics uh, Budni is the uh, fourth winner. And the fifth winner is National Thermal Park Operation Mauda. So these are the five winners uh, from, an, uh, from a company level. And for the category, creating awareness on energy efficiency and energy conservation, we have again five winners. Uh, Mr. Mahesh Patel, Deputy Manager ENI from JK Lakshmi Cement is the winner. Uh, next, please. Um, Mr. Jai Pratap Singh, Executive Vardaman Fabrics for the upcoming energy efficient technologies is the winner. Uh, Mr. Shiva Yogimath, Managing Director, Soul Power India, is the third winner. And the fourth, Mr. Naveen Kumar Sharma, Plant Head, Udaipur Cement Works. And the last uh, winner, actually three of them have uh, set up a team. Vivek Gupta, Senior Maintenance Manager, uh, Mr. Paolo, Mr. Praful Sahani from Indian Oil Corporation, Panipat Refinery. So I would like to thank all the participants who participated in the in this event and also my congratulations to the winners. And we are looking forward to an exciting week ahead with uh, 30 plus speakers in the Enercon 2020. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Dr. Forbes, uh, for, for that insightful session. Uh, it's always, uh, you know, um, Nice to listen to your thoughts and you clearly have articulated that uh, we are in the right industry and I'm sure a lot of youngsters listening to us uh, should really go back uh, motivated. And I truly believe we are in the right industry, not because I'm sitting in the industry, which is energy efficiency, but I think in, we are in the cusp of transformation in my view, where we can make a big difference to the sustainable development goals through the energy efficiency and climate change. And also we make a lot of sense for people and planet. So on that high note, I would like to thank everybody for joining us in this energy efficiency uh, leadership series session. And I really look forward to welcoming you all tomorrow for the Enercon 2020. Thank you very much. And we are signing off from here.
Thank you, Ravi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.